So hello everyone. Um, this is a talk about what I consider to be Clojure's superpower. Oh, let me just get rid of the sidebar, there we go. Uh, I will say while I'm giving this presentation, I've got two screens going. I'm doing the audio and video from one screen, which allows me to have the, the virtual backdrop. And then I'm actually presenting from the other screen, which means that when I'm looking at my editor and coding, I'll be doing this. So don't think I'm, I'm being a little weird there. It's just because I'm looking at the other screen. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep a good eye on chat while this happens. Uh, so that's another reason why I have two screens going uh, to make sure that I know what you're seeing and that if those problems come up, I'll see them in chat. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I've been senior software architect at various companies. Um, I moved over to America in 99 and about a year later joined Macromedia as their senior software architect. And for the last, gosh, now 13, nearly 14 years, I've worked from home remotely because both broad choice allowed partial working from home and World Singles Networks is uh, a completely 100% remote company. Uh, I'm the only member of staff in the Bay Area. Uh, we have about 40 online dating sites. We have actually, I think, close to 108,000 lines of closure at this point. Um, we went to production in spring of 2011 on an alpha of Clojure 1.3, and we've been using pre-releases of Clojure in production pretty much ever since. We have alpha 4 of 1.10.2 on most things in production right now, and we have RC1 in one process and RC2 in QA. Um, the stability of Clojure is what allows us to do that. It's always been a, a very, very stable platform for us. I came to Clojure through a fairly long route. Uh, my first jobs were writing Assembler and COBOL. I worked for an insurance company and uh, I really loved writing Assembler. I thought Assembler was great fun, COBOL not so much. And then the traditional sort of languages, C, C++, Java, and while I was at Macromedia, they bought Allaire. And so we were the owners all of a sudden of Cold Fusion. And because we just bought this new server side product, they thought it would be great if the uh, server team, which is basically my team, uh, used Cold Fusion instead of Java and C++ to build things on the website. And I found that that was actually a, a fun community to be part of, very, very friendly, very supportive. Uh, much like the Closer community is, very encouraging for beginners. And so I did Cold Fusion on and off for years. And in fact, at World Singles, we still have some Cold Fusion programs in production. Uh, then I went off and did Groovy and some Scala. And after I joined World Singles, we had a particular problem that we they had tried several different tech with. And I tried with Scala and we got it working, um, but it was a little flaky. Back then it was the actor library had memory leaks and things like that. So I'd seen uh, uh, Amit Rathor was running a workshop just across the bay from me. And I thought, oh, closure. Oh, that looks interesting. I did a bit of lisp at university. Um, you know, let's go see what this is about. And so I learned closure from Amit Rathor at his Saturday workshop. Thought it was great and started playing with it at work. And the other developers actually really liked it too when I introduced them. So that's how we've been doing closure in production for, like I say, nearly 10 years. Um, I do a lot of open source. I've always done a lot of open source, um, starting with uh, C++ libraries back in the early 90s. Uh, I came into Clojure's open source environment because when we got started, we were using Clojure for a lot of CRUD stuff and no one was maintaining what was then Clojure Contrib SQL. And it was the big 1.2, 1.3 split of Contrib. And I jumped up and down and kept pestering about having this well-maintained. Uh, and eventually I think it was Stu Halloway or one of the, the Cognitech folks, well, they weren't Cognitech back then, said, look, if, if you're that excited about you know, looking after the library, why don't you maintain it? And so when it became Closure Java JDBC, that was my first Closure open source project. And I've just kind of been chugging along ever since. And most of the reason that I do the open source is because it's fun. 
but also the projects I work on are projects that we generally use at work. So I have a, a really strong vested interest in you know, maintaining these projects and keeping them running. So REPL-driven development. Um, we've just had a thread on Clojureverse actually, which said, you know, is this really a good name for what we're doing? Um, lots of languages have a REPL. And so people who use those languages, they say, well, you know, what's special about Clojure's REPL? We already have a REPL. And the real difference is that in Clojure, the REPL is front and center. It's, it works with your code the same way that the code would be compiled, however you run it. Each form is loaded and compiled. Um, you can have a REPL running in a live application, um, which we do. We have REPLs running in some of our production processes. And it's kind of great for debugging to just be able to connect through an SSH tunnel and uh, you know, run queries or run functions to see what's going on in production just to debug stuff. And we do occasionally patch a process live over the REPL. Um, now, you know, why am I doing this talk? Since you know, all Clojure developers must be using the REPL. Uh, Stuart Holloway did a, a great talk back in 2017 about REPL-driven development. And one of the things he said in it is, I am baffled when people type things into the REPL. And that really struck me because all of the tutorials for Clojure tend to say, fire up a REPL and start typing in code. And even if you look through some of the, sort of the deeper tutorials, they don't really focus on working from the editor and having the REPL just as your live application engine. So what I'm going to do in this talk is very much uh, the REPLs get started up and sits in a corner. Uh, and I work entirely in the editor. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be live coding, so things might go wrong. Uh, I am using the latest Clojure CLI tools and my dot .closure repo and aliases. Uh, I'll provide the links at the end, but they're all up on GitHub. Uh, when I first agreed to give the talk, I was using Atom and Chlorine, and I've since switched to VS Code and Clover, which is essentially exactly the same plugin system. Uh, and in fact, I've even brought across all my key maps, and my key map is exactly the same between those two setups. And I use a socket REPL mainly because I can fire up any process and with a JVM option, I can have a socket REPL running in it with no other code, and no other dependencies. So I kind of like that simple tools approach. All of this is possible with Linegan, uh, NREPL, Emacs, BI, Cursive, any of these, um, even the, the hot loading of dependencies, uh, which I'll show because that's kind of one of the core things to how I work. Um, why did I switch from Atom to VS Code? Uh, Atom just doesn't get as much love. VS Code has Microsoft behind it, and so it gets a lot of maintenance and updates and a lot of good integration with other packages. So that's it's a very pragmatic reason. Uh, and from my point of view, because my key map is the same and the extension I'm using is essentially the same, really it doesn't matter which editor I'm using as long as those all work. Uh, I'm going to be uh, showing dynamic addition of dependencies. Uh, you can do this with Linegan with Pomegranate. I don't think that people do this very much, but I've kind of gotten used to it. Uh, I'm using the Ad3, AdLib3 branch from Toolsteps Alpha. Uh, that's kind of experimental and subject to change. In fact, it's already changed quite a bit in the time I've been using it. Uh, the API has changed. And there's talk that something like that will be merged into uh, TDA or Clojure itself at some point. So the idea that you can add dependencies to a running application without restarting your REPL uh, is something that we can all expect to be able to take advantage of. Uh, I use Reveal to supplement the REPL. Um, I see Reveal's author is, is, on the, uh, is in the audience as well. So no pressure on me there. Thank you, Vlad. Um, it is optional. Uh, I like the way that it uh, lets me inspect a lot of things while I'm working. Uh, I used Cognitex Rebel quite a while. And I switched partly because Reveal is open source and it's easy for me to hack on and add functionality to. And I'll show something that's become core to my workload, workflow, which is uh, it's, it's up in my 
dot closure repo, but it's some extensions to reveal. Uh, there's Portal as well, which works in a similar way. It's browser-based. Uh, and part of the core idea behind all of these is um, Datafy and Nav, which is something that got introduced in Closure 1.10 to provide a, a generalized way of turning anything, any object into data that you can inspect and then navigating it in a way that makes sense for the underlying object. I want this to be interactive, so feel free to interrupt and ask as many questions as you want. Um, this is, like I said earlier, this is really about uh, hoping that you'll get as much um, useful information out of it as you, you can. So feel free to run me off on a tangent and ask me questions. Uh, I'm going to build something very simple. Uh, I'm going to build a very, very small web app from scratch. And I will start literally from ground zero, creating a project, uh, starting Rebel, and then adding codes and tests. Um, and just see how far we get in about an hour. Um, but I'm not constrained for time. So if we want to go longer, I can. If folks need to bail, that's fine. I won't be in the least bit offended. So I have an empty directory here. I'm going to create uh, a brand new project in it. Hopefully folks can see that. And apologies if you hear someone snoring in the background. It's one of my cats who's sitting just behind my laptop and snoring very loudly. OK, so let's start up Visual Code. So VS Code Studio, here's our project. OK, and then let's start the REPL. And like I say, I'm using uh, the CLI. I'm using aliases from my uh, .closure file. Uh, why, why switch from Linegan? I actually switched from Linegan to boot originally. Um, when we got started, obviously, uh, Linegan was the only game in town. And so you, you pretty much had to use Linegan. And we had a pretty complicated setup at work. And gradually, we got to the point where we needed more programmability. We wanted to be able to essentially write plugins, but write a lot of them and customize it a fair bit. Uh, we have a mono repo with over three dozen sub projects in. We build, um, I think, about 14 or 15 production artifacts from that. Uh, and it was, it was getting a bit hard with Linegan to, to make that really work effectively. And Boot had just had a fairly major rewrite and had become very stable and usable. And it was very programmable. We could just write our custom tasks directly in Boot as functions. Uh, but after a period of time, we started to run into some bugs with boot. The file set abstraction um, became slow to work with, with the size of code base we had. And we also found that the, the pod system, which is where it lets you have isolated class loader instances, uh, it does an asynchronous refresh on those, and that started to cause us problems as well. So when the closure CLI came along, uh, and me being of the mind that, you know, if there's new stuff coming out of Cognitech, I want to try it. Uh, I decided to have a go at switching our repo over from boot to the CLI. And uh, that's worked very well. We have a depths in every sub project. And we kind of have the idea of a master depths file, which pins all of our versions. And so we can, we can run up uh, processes from any of the sub-projects very, very easily with the CLI and, and all the tools are there and compose very nicely. So let's see. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK, I will try and remember to come back to the, um, the benefits of REPL-driven development for people who don't use that type of thing. OK, so I have reveal popped up here. Oh. Yes, thank you. Hey, Google. Um, I have uh, a custom view, which you can go look at in my .closure file. Uh, the thing that I liked about 
Rebel, Cognitex Rebel, was that it automatically displayed uh, values in a table. So this is essentially just a custom piece added to reveal that pretty much just displays any value I execute automatically in a table without me having to do anything. Okay, so I'm going to connect my REPL. And I don't tend to look at the REPL window. Oh, one thing to note, chlorine and clover, the REPL pane is read-only. You can't type into the REPL, which is another reason I like it. Uh, so I'm not going to be tempted to type into a REPL. And if I really needed to type something quickly, just look at it, I can always go back to my console REPL here. So we'll load the file. OK, so what I'm going to do is I am going to start to use ad libs to add some stuff. Obviously, we're going to need ring if we're going to do that. So let's start with a comment. Um, a useful tip that I just picked up from someone on Slack that unfortunately, I don't remember who it was suggested it, was if you put a comma at the end of a comment block, it'll defeat par infer and par edit trying to fix the parenthesis up onto the line before. And it makes it easier to get at expressions that are in this section of the REPL. Did I just do this check? No. Oh. oh, silly me. Dot depths, tools, dot depths, tools, depths. There we go. Okay, and we see we get a nil value here, and it displays it with some metadata here and in a table. Okay, so we've got ad libs now. So we want to add a uh, ring. And I don't know what the most recent version of that is, but I'll go look that up later. For now, I'll be lazy and use release, which I think is deprecated in Maven. So, you know, probably shouldn't use it, but it's a nice lazy thing for development. And what we get back from ad libs is the list of all the dependencies it's loaded. So uh, this has, um, yeah, someone wants the font increased. I can do that in the main editor. It's going to be harder for reveal. I would actually have to start that up. There we go. Let's see. Is that better? There we go. Yeah, you said that. OK. Um, all right, so now I've got a ring in here. Let's pull this in, let's say, choir. And I know that I want to use the ring adapter jetty, and I will evaluate the top level form straight away. Uh, and this is one of the things about the replica driven development flow that I like to emphasize. You don't need to save the file, you can just evaluate the forms. And importantly, you should evaluate every form you change. So, as I've added the require into the NS and evaluated the top level uh, form, and now ring adapter jetty is available for me. And, you know, I've loaded in a namespace. Let's just say that I can't remember uh, everything about it. So I want to go look at that and say, OK, well, let's find namespace ring adapter jetty and see what's public in it. And I can't spell, can I? Yep, yep, I can. Why did that not? I obviously didn't press it harder. OK, so we have the items from the table here. And this has shown me the list of all the public variables in the namespace. I'll often do this if I require uh, a library that I'm not very familiar with. Rather than going off to the web, I will try and navigate it all in the REPL. Uh, and I find NS public, so find NS so useful that I've actually got a hotkey uh, and some code behind that that will show me uh, the information about a particular namespace. And so if we go over here, we'll run Jetty, that's going to be what I want to run. So let's pull it up and look at its documentation. 
And so here's the documentation in line, and I'm going to want it to join false because I want to start it in my editor, uh, and I'll give it a port number. Okay, so let's just go back and refer run jetty. And again, eval the top level namespace, uh, top level form, and we will put a handler in here. that just returns a, a simple uh, and evaluate the top level form. And I'll do it in this comment block I've got here for now. OK. And so having started that, um, ah, I'm going to want to be able to stop it at some point. So I'm actually going to do that from here and then redo the uh, And of course, my keyboard has just died. Let's try that again. There we go. And it will stop that server. OK. Let me now put this in Okay. So now I have a var with the server running, and I can go look at that in a browser. And we get hello world in a very small font. There we go. Okay, now. One of the things here, if you look on the closure.org site, you'll see uh, there's a good long section on REPL. Uh, and uh, one of the things it talks about is writing REPL friendly code so that you can keep your REPL running and you don't have to do restarts and reloads. And one of the tricks there is using a var reference when you're passing a function um, essentially by name because it introduces an indirection. If you just used app, it would get the current value of whatever app is, which would be a function, and pass that function into run jetty, which would mean that if you change app, um, that new value of the function won't be seen. So if you use a var with a pound quote, or you could say var around it, then you're going to be able to change the function. So let's just try that. Okay, and I will evaluate the top level form and I will go back to the browser and we can see that it's changed. So we haven't had to, um, we haven't had to restart the REPL. Uh, we haven't you know, had to do any fancy stuff like stopping and starting the server. We can actually just program with the server live. Okay, so now let's see what Okay, so we're going to build, obviously we need a bit more magic than just ring. We're going to put in ring defaults and stuff like that. So this time I am going to go look it up. Okay, ring defaults. Ring defaults 032. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, this is, this is a little odd, um, but this is kind of a useful trick if you're working with Depth's EDN. Um, as I think it was John earlier pointed out, you can put uh, ignore forms in. So uh, pound underscore, hash underscore, as I used to say when I was a Brit. Uh, I'm just going to give it an arbitrary namespace. Uh, I'm going to require closure tools depths alpha rubble refer ad libs. Okay, and so now what I can do is I can evaluate this form, and it's going to evaluate as code, uh, even though it's in a depth CDN file because it's got a namespace now, and the editor will think that it's basically closure code, but it will still load as EDN because the ignore form is in there. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, well, you know, let's what, see what other depths we want. We know that we want ring. Because, of course, if you're loading dynamically uh, into the REPL, you also need to keep your dependencies 
uh, in sync here as well. And then let me just check what was the ring, ring defaults. Okay. So ring, ring defaults. Oh, three, two. Okay. And now what we'll do again, little trick, uh, ad libs. And what I want is for this code here. So now I can switch fairly quickly between my EDN file. And you can see now that uh, CLJ Condo is complaining that this is all illegal in here. And indeed it is because uh, I don't have a value for the depths key, but I can evaluate that. And we'll see it's downloading stuff and there. It's brought in ring SSL, ring defaults, ring headers, and ring anti-forgery. And then so we don't forget, let's take the quote away and move that back. So now it's valid EDN again. But note, I haven't actually saved the file anyway, so I'll just save it while it's valid EDN. So now we have ring defaults. Uh, so let's add that in. And I will have to go look at it to see how you use it. Ring middleware defaults. Ring middleware defaults. I'm going to refer uh, site defaults, I think it is. Site defaults, wrap defaults. Okay. And again, evaluate top level form. And now we're going to want to wrap this up in something. So I am going to let's see what is the easiest way to do this. This time, because I'm, all I'm going to do is uh, have my own handler. I'll rename this, so I'll change it to handler and evaluate. And then I'm going to wrap defaults again with the bar trick uh, and site defaults, I think is what it was telling me to do. Have a quick look, wrap defaults, handler site defaults, depth site, okay. So again, evaluate. And that should still work in my browser. So if I go back to this and we're still getting that and check that I can still change it. And now, because I have ring defaults in play, it's trying to do content type uh, uh, detection. So it's merrily saying, oh, you want me to download this instead of display it in a browser. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in the content type here uh, in headers. And just check that that's now worked. Come on, there we go. Hello, closure. So we're still, we haven't saved the file. We've still got the REPL running. We haven't had to stop the server. And we've now switched to having middleware in there uh, with site defaults. Okay, let's clean this up a bit. Uh, what I'm going to add in here is ring util response. Yeah. So that I can take advantage of some utilities in there. Okay. And now we want this to be a response of And just to double check, we haven't broken it. And so we're still good. So we're able to refactor. Um, we're able to you know, redefine our functions and so on. Let's see, folks are asking some stuff in the chat. Let's have a look. Uh, 
discovering namespaces provided by a dependency. Yeah, you know, that's a tricky one. Um, because the artifact that you depend on, there's no necessary connection to the namespaces within it. Um, it's, it's probably one of the things that's the most unfortunate about not having fixed conventions for that. Uh, so you do have to go back to the documentation. Um, if you know the namespace, but you don't know the things, that, the things that are in it, then of course you can browse the namespaces in code. Let's see, what else are folks asking? Uh, good point. Yes, someone said I could have just used NS publics on the symbol. Uh, I'm used to using find NS because I can do that to get the namespace object and then call a whole bunch of other things on it. Uh, someone asked, how do I add, how do I keep track of the libraries? And that, of course, is why I put the stuff into depths EDN. Uh, because if you don't keep your depths in sync, you're going to get in a bit of a mess. And yes, I do leave nearly all of the exploration comments in my code. Uh, Stu Halloway coined a term rich content uh, comment forms for this uh, because Rich does this. Uh, and if you look through the closure source code, you will see several namespaces where there's a comment block in them. And it has code that is used to set things up. Sometimes it has code that's used to test stuff. Um, I do this a lot where I will have a main function um, that sets up a component, builds a system, starts the component, uh, and I'll have a comment block underneath it that will uh, provide for an easier way to do it in the REPL. And yep, there we go. It's... Yeah, the, the auto suggest, um, I'm relying on whatever Clover provides. Uh, if, you, if you have complement as one of your dependencies, uh, Chlorine and Clover will leverage that and provide better completion. Um, mostly I find, since I'm working in a large code base day in, day out, and tend to have it all up and running all the time, the editor gradually kind of learns what's available in the code base. Uh, and that's, that's just the way Clover works. That it says, if I know these symbols, I'll suggest them. Uh, some tools, in fact, Chlorine uh, among them, will show you the arg lists when you are working with a function. So when you get uh, a list of functions come up. So if I just go back to the slash on this and start typing. So it'll give me the suggestions for these, but it doesn't show me the arguments. So I have a, let's see. There we go. Um, I have a hotkey bound to uh, essentially, you know, look up the current var, uh, which will also work on a namespace because the way I've got it set up. And so that will let me see the metadata, so arg lists, the documentation, and it also displays the documentation as a formatted string, uh, just because I find it convenient. Okay. Yes, yes, once you've got the jar down, splitting it open and then looking inside to see what the, the actual class names are. And then from those, you can figure out the namespaces. It would be, it would be kind of nice to have some built-in tooling that would make that easier. Okay. So let's see, let's, uh, let's add Soma, which I use for templating at work. Uh, let's go back in here and we will add in yet another dependency. And here we see, again, a list of things included the dread, dreaded Jackson library gets pulled in by that. Leave it as valid EDN again.
And this is one of those where you definitely would need to know the, the namespace names because sama.parza is has always struck me as a very strange namespace for the, the main thing that renders the templates. Okay. So I'm going to stick something in resources. Uh, let's add a file there. And let's just check that we can make that work. So now that we've got that, if we set HTML uh, render file and that did not do what I expected because ah, because I didn't provide the data. So there we go. We can see the, the file is rendering in line. And again, that's somewhere where I should have just done this and said, well, what does it take as arguments? I'm going to close that view out. OK, so we have a template. Uh, we can, let's make this. And so I like to use Soma for web apps. We actually use it for uh, generating HTML emails mostly. Uh, and our main apps are all REST APIs, but we do have some closure apps that actually generate HTML. Uh, so that's that. And let's see, let's replace this now with rendering that. So what we're going to do is let's just take this form. And there we go. Go to here. Oh, okay. Because I took the response out, my bad. I still need to tell it we're going to have a response of that. Okay. Now, one of the things that folks asked about is tap, because I don't know if you've noticed, but you'll see tap is at the beginning of every line that's appearing in reveal over here on the right. Um, tap is something that got introduced in Closure 1.10, and it's something I use a lot when I'm debugging. Uh, and you know, if I hadn't immediately known what the answer to that was, I would have gone in and tapped that uh, value to look at why it wasn't producing what I expect. Uh, reveal and uh, Cognitex Rebel and Portal uh, all support tap output. The nice thing about tap is that you can send any value out to whatever's listening on tap uh, and you can leave that in the code because it does it on a, a little queue so when the queue is full it's just going to ignore it and you don't have to worry about it the kind of odd thing at the moment is that tap is a function that takes a value and returns true or false true means i put it on the queue false means i didn't uh, which means you can't just drop it into a threaded uh, expression but um, what you can do is you can use do to, uh, which will apply the function and then return the original version. So let's just show that as an example now. And if we go back into reveal, we'll see that we see the status, headers, and the body. And so liberal use of tap when you're debugging is, is very, very helpful, I find. Okay, so we've had a uh, a few more questions in here. Okay, so the purpose of using comment versus just evaluating the expressions. Yeah, um, the comment forms, it's important to know that the difference between the different types of comments. Uh, if you have a semicolon comment, that text is just uh, ignored to the end of the line. If you have the uh, discard form, which is the, the hash underscore, the form is read, so it must be valid closure syntax, uh, but then it is completely thrown away. So you'll see in the hash map where I have paths and a list, depths, and this, even though this piece is in the middle of it, 
uh, the reader completely discards that. And so it's as if there was just depth and then the value that goes with it. And the comment form evaluates to nil. So I said that the, the comma at the end is useful. If you don't have that, uh, par infer, for example, we'll try and put the parenthesis back up here. And let me just take this away, see that it's going to, yeah. So now I have the closing parenthesis for the comment form at the end of the line before. And if I evaluate that, I get nil because comment evaluates to nil. So comment does stay in the code. It does do something specific. Uh, and you can see that, that if I had a, if I evaluate this form, you'll see that it's valid and the comment is evaluated to nil. So, you know, you are going to have nils in your code if you do that, but I find it a, a much clearer looking thing, uh, expression to, to work with. Uh, you could have a do with the discard form if you wanted. Does that answer the questions for folks? And yeah, you don't want real life code just lying around in there because it'll get executed. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think is important, I mean, we've got the REPL for exploring things. Uh, and I often leave these experiments in, even you know if it's, it's whole steps of things where I was looking at data structures, because I can come back to it later, go through the steps, evaluating them again, uh, and going, oh yes, that's right, that's when I built it up this way. And in fact, I was just working on some code yesterday where uh, I was trying to figure out, I've got a, a fairly complicated data structure, which is sort of the dynamic framework behind a member profile on our dating sites. And uh, we have sections on the profile, like uh, your lifestyle, your physical attributes, um, your, you know, your interests. And then those have a whole bunch of questions that we ask folks that people can fill in. And all of that is, is very data-driven. We actually have a description that says, these are the sections, these are the questions in this order within each section, these are the types of fields they are, uh, which lends itself very nicely to closure. Um, but I was trying to extract just a couple of attributes out of this to display in the admin console. And so I did the whole thing inside a comment form, just gradually building up the steps of going and getting the sections, uh, going and getting the IETN translations of it, uh, and navigating down to the piece I needed. Uh, and in the end, I had just two nested function calls, but I left all of the other stuff in there to see that I can get there, uh, see how I got there. Oh, tap is in closure script. Yeah, that's useful. That's useful. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. We are, we're about an hour total. Um, are there specific things folks would like me to show, uh, or I can just continue to to mess around with it, building up a little web app here? But I think at this point I've shown most of the key things that uh, I find important. One more thing, which I was going to do, and I just remembered, is testing. Now, this was a brand new uh, project. So it does have a test file in it that's just going to fail. Um, if we load that up and run the tests from the editor, we'll see ran one test, one test failed. Uh, we would have to go to the REPL to see that. Uh, I have a hotkey bound to run what I call to side run my tests. And I think, I think this is available in CIDR and a few other things. Uh, if you follow the convention that your test namespaces are always the same as your source namespaces, but with dash test on it, uh, then you should be able to uh, run the tests from your source namespace. Uh, and you'll see here uh, in reveal, it put the summary of the test run in there uh, because that's what I've got set up as the hotkey for doing that side running. And that way I don't have to go look in the actual REPL panel, although I certainly could. And I'll see there's the summary from running it. Um, and Clover lets you expand stuff like this, which I think some of the other editor in integrations do as well. Uh, but the nice thing about that is that 
you can be working with stuff in your comments. You can get to a certain point where you say, oh yeah, okay, this code that I have in my comment would make a great little test. And then you can just copy and paste it into your test namespace uh, as a, a test with an assertion. And then don't worry about it because you can come back to your source form and just rerun your tests whenever you need. Okay, let's just scroll back in the chat a bit more. Um, ah, Mauricio's here. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I've actually I just started to come back to ClojureScript after a break of seven years, uh, and the ClojureScript world is very very different to what it was seven years ago, and I I tried Shadow CLJS when I was um, sort of hacking on chlorine with Mauricio uh, a little bit when that first came out because I was trying to add in my little customizations and shadow seems very nice um, but I thought I'd try figwheel recently and so I went and got figwheel main installed and I like the workflow with that and one of the things I saw was the CLJS dev tools which works in Chrome and uh, Microsoft's new edge and it actually will show closure values or closure script values uh, in a really nice sort of tree form and expandable. So that's really nice. Okay. Uh, that's a good link from Peter there about uh, namespaces in a jar file. Yes, the, the tools namespace lets you explore jar files. So that actually, we could build a tool that would do that, definitely. <laughs> How do I still get work done while I'm working with all these uh, new tools and stuff. Um, one thing that I, I will say that I love about where I work is that uh, we are encouraged to always explore new tools to see if they can help us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's it's not quite the 80-20 the that places like Google advertise, but we are encouraged to, to explore, to learn. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have a subscription to purely functional TV through work, which you know, I've been working my way through the various courses there, which is uh, you know a nice, useful resource. And I go off and explore libraries that people mention on Slack, uh, and you know I'll pull them down into a REPL and experiment with them. Um, one of the things that I've got a, a ticket open for is to look at uh, Coax from Exoscale, which is it builds on Spec uh, to do coercions because we were a, an early adopter of closure spec at work. Uh, and I've looked at spec coerce and I was originally thinking of changing some of our conforming specs over to coerce, uh, spec coerce, but I think I'm probably gonna use coax instead now. Uh, and certainly, you know, we're encouraged to look at those sort of new libraries and play with them and, and see whether it works. So the short answer is you gotta work for a company that's going to allow you to cut out time to explore new libraries and explore new ways to work, uh, which I wish all companies did, because I think it's very important as engineers that we get the chance to look at how we can improve our workflow. Yeah, the Chrome DevTools is, is yeah, I, I've been pretty impressed with the DevTools in the browser uh, and my little experiments with ClojureScript so far. Uh, if I'd been a bit further down the line, I would probably have thrown big wheel into this. Um, and the, I've done a bit of work. If you if you look at my doc closure repo, you'll see there's a dev CLJ file in there, uh, which I there's a, an alias to load that, which is what my colon dev alias does. Uh, and if it detects big wheel is on the the path, it actually will start things up a little differently. It looks for rebel reveal, um, rebel read line and fig wheel and starts the appropriate uh, combination of rebels. And so the workflow I've been using so far with fig wheel is to write as much as possible in .clJC files. And therefore I can use a closure REPL for evaluating code and running tests. And uh, the, the auto reload that fig wheel does means that my browser uh, is always picking up the latest JS. Uh, so that's that's been quite a nice workflow so far, but I'm still in the early days with ClojureScript. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump back to the, the slides at this point and just talk through the last set of slides, and then I can come back to the code and do anything that people want. 
Uh, so kind of the, the lessons that I want folks to take away from this is, as yes, Stu says, don't type into your REPL. Uh, always type into your editor and evaluate the forms because then you get the all the support from your editor. You're going to get um, you're going to get the syntax support, uh, bracket coloring if you've got that enabled. You're going to get the code assist uh, with completion and arg lookup and everything else. Uh, yes, Rebel Readline gives you a lot of that, um, but still, if you typo something, you've now either got to copy and paste. In your REPL, or you've got to go back and edit it. Whereas if you've got it in your source file, editing and fixing mistakes and, and keeping a record, all of that is much, much easier. Uh, the other thing is that I don't have any sort of tooling or magic here. Uh, I have just a socket REPL. It's the same whether I'm working on a local process like I am now. Uh, I start my REPL up separately to my editor because that way it stays running even if my editor crashes or goes away uh, and it also means that if i've got a REPL running in a different process i can just connect the editor to that we have legacy apps written in cold fusion but they run on the jvm and we use closure inside those apps and they start up we start them up with a REPL, a socket REPL, and so even when i'm working in our legacy apps i can still have a REPL connected and work inside my editor uh, and work with the closure portion of the application at least directly uh, from the editor. Um, my REPL stays open for days or weeks. Uh, I shut a REPL down last week that had been running since before Christmas um, just because I needed to reboot my Mac. My Mac had been running for 90 days without a reboot. Um, I generally will have perhaps multiple REPLs running on my machine um, for different projects. At work, we actually have a, an everything sub-project that we, we run a script that creates uh, like an uber deps.edn from all of the sub-projects. And that's where we start our REPL. Uh, Hired Man, who's my, my teammate, he's a hardcore Emacs guy. Um, but again, he also uses very, very simple tools. He uses inferior closure mode uh, and has the, the REPL literally just a socket REPL or bare command line REPL running from there. Uh, I try very hard to write REPL friendly code so I don't have to worry about shutting down processes and starting them back up. Uh, I don't have to worry about namespace reloading for the most part. Occasionally, I will get myself into a mess, um, but usually just uh, unaliasing a symbol or removing a namespace and then reloading it is sufficient to get it going again. Um, there's some tricks around, for example, uh, def multi, that if you def the name to nil immediately above the def multi, then if you change things and reload the namespace, um, it will erase the, multi, the, the multi method and then redefine it so you don't get weird stale multi methods. Um, if you're using def once, you can do a, a you can do similar tricks on that, really. You can alter var root or whatever else. So there's, there's tricks you can use to not have to blow everything away. OK, so let's see. Uh, it was a good place to find an example of tapping into production code. It feels very scary. It is scary. Um, I mean, we, we run REPLs in some of our production processes. Um, and I will set up an SSH tunnel, and then I will connect my editor, literally VS code that I'm using right now to that production process. And I can either load new code into it or I can have a comment form and eval things from that. Um, I don't know that there's a huge amount of material out there that talks about it. Um, but there is, of course, the, the story of NASA uh, fixing one of their early uh, spaceship projects by having a list in it with a REPL and fixing it via the REPL. So, you know, there's definitely a precedent for doing that. Interactive comment development. Yeah, that's, we. I don't know whether we've got to come up with a better name or whether we've just got to um, teach people what we really mean by REPL driven development. Do I find myself moving code from comments into tests? Yes. Um, because I'm trying to work focused in one file while I'm, I'm working on uh, a feature as much as possible, 
I will end up ultimately with my tests written in a comment form. And then when I am more comfortable that I know exactly what the data structures look like, what the values are going to be, what the behavior is, uh, I can say, okay, this is a test. Now, TDD, you're going to do the tests ahead of time because the whole point is you write your tests first. And there are certain things that I build where I will definitely write the test first. We, in our REST API, whenever I'm adding uh, a new API endpoint, I will write a series of tests that outline all of the error conditions I expect to get, as well as a happy path. Uh, and I will write those first so they all fail. Uh, and that will give me a checklist based on the requirements of uh, all of the conditions I need to fulfill. Uh, and then once I've got that in place, I will actually, in the small, be working REPL driven as I'm building out the code. Uh, which port to use? I I randomly use port 5000 for what I'm working on at work locally and 50505 for anything I've just got a scratch um, REPL for. You can actually start the socket REPL up uh, with port zero and it will go and find a port to use. Uh, but then you have to run some code to get it to tell which port it chose, uh, unlike nREPL, which actually prints out the port it uses. And do we pair program? Kevin and I don't actually pair program. Um, our front-end JS developers do pair program, and I think they both, they, they all use the same editor. Um, I know if I was going to pair with, with Kevin, we would either screen share and both work on his Emacs setup or uh, screen share and work on my VS code setup. Uh, I think when you're doing pairing, having one person in the driving seat and one person navigating is, is a good way to do that. Um, but you know, we're a very small company, so some of the front end stuff is pair programmed, back end stuff, not so much. Uh, this PDF, the PDF of this will be up somewhere. Um, so you'll be able to get it all the links, but I have the link to my GitHub, which has my .closure, my VS Code Clover setup, uh, things like CLJ New, which I used, uh, DevStar, which is how I build jar files. Uh, there's a lot of good documentation on the CLI, um, including a list of all the community tools that are available. Uh, if you look on closure.org, it's got a great guide on using the REPL, including uh, writing REPL friendly programs, which is kind of near the end of that, which talks about the bar trick instead of using functions and so on. Uh, Stuart's talk, uh, which he gave to the Chicago group, is on Vimeo. Uh, and if you don't mind spending some money, Eric Normand has a fabulous course on REPL driven development, uh, which was the thing that hooked me into purely functional TV. So I think that is awesome. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm Sean Caulfield, absolutely everywhere, um, even on Facebook, although that is purely non-tech. Uh, I do have a blog, and that is built with Clojure, uh, Cryogen, which used to be built with Jekyll and Octopress, and I got to the point where I couldn't keep a Ruby environment running on my machine without it just breaking constantly. Uh, so I'm very happy that Cryogen exists. So let's see. Yeah, it's a good question. What about writing unit tests in the same namespace? I think that that's, that's a pretty reasonable thing while you're developing um, and while you're starting to write tests. Uh, there's even a uh, with test macro, I think it's called with test, enclosure test, which you can wrap around a function definition. Uh, and it actually lets you put the assertions directly into the code around function. Um, the only problem with that is that most of the test runners don't look in your source files for this sort of stuff. Um, and if you, if you go look in my GitHub repo, you'll see, the, no, it's not under my GitHub repo, it's under closure expectations. There's a closure test compatible version of expectations. And in the docs for that, I specifically talk about where to put tests and how to run them. Uh, and one of the things there is, is the caveats around with test. And, is there a trick to writing which comment forms that makes them easier to convert to tests? Um, not really. I mean, one of the things that would probably make it easier um, would be 
to have uh, the output of running the expression get inserted directly into the code as a comment, uh, which was something I was doing with chlorine. I had an optional eval that took the result and pasted it back in as a comment immediately after the expression. And then you've got the expected result right next to the, the test. Um, you can, of course, you know, in your comment, bring in closure test and, and write full on closure test assertions with is and equals in your comment block and they will run. Uh, so there's that. Mount or integrant? No, uh, we use component. Um, we, we started out without it. We started out having global singletons and we still pay the, the painful cost of that almost every day for going down that path. Uh, and so we have gradually switched over to having pretty much everything built with component. There's, we still have some legacy bits that are still globals and we, we actively chip away at those as we can. The thing I like about component is it's very, very simple. It has start, it has stop, uh, and it has the dependency graph aspect. Mount relies on, as far as I'm concerned, it relies on global state, even though it's it's state in namespaces. Um, and I just don't like that as much because I've been bitten so badly by having globals in a namespace. Uh, integrant looks very interesting. It has, I think, seven lifecycle points. So it is substantially more complicated or flexible depending on your point of view. Um, and I kind of like things that are simple and composable. Uh, the other thing is when I've looked at code bases that use integrant, it's kind of hard to just look at the code base and see what the life cycle of something is because it's split across a whole bunch of multi-methods. So I just find that a little hard to work with. Do I use midge? No, I do not. I, I do not like midge at all. Um, it creates a DSL that doesn't look like closure as far as I'm concerned. And it isn't compatible with closure tests, so you need midge specific tooling for it. And it's actually why I created my README library, because uh, the only thing I was using midge for in one of my projects was the fact that it has a way of turning the code examples in your README into midge tests. Um, and that was so useful. And my desire to get away from Midge was so great that I ended up writing uh, a project that turns readmes into closure test compatible uh, tests. Okay, let's see. Yeah, uh, the, the issue of, of copying and pasting um, results, yeah. I, I do sometimes copy the uh, Clover output from the REPL pane back in. And of course, using reveal, it's all copy and pasteable in reveal as well. So that's uh, another nice reason for using reveal. That's interesting. Yeah, the Jupyter stuff. I, I haven't looked at uh, that, which my understanding is that's where you kind of you write a document, but you have code in it and the code is kind of live. Um, I don't know whether that would scale to large systems. It intuitively doesn't feel like it would scale to large systems for me. Um, but I think as a an interactive live experience, something like that, uh, clips, I think is a very interesting way of having live examples in your uh, documentation. Okay, so yeah, so the, the notebook stuff is good for exploratory stuff. Yeah, I can imagine that it's, it's, it's a very rich REPL experience um, in that respect. You know, I mean, I find that even if I'm just doing some quick exploratory stuff, I will tend to do it in the context of code that I already have open in my editor and uh, the REPL that I already have running. So firing up something separate for an explor exploration is, is just not an intuitive thing for me. Hi, Sean. So one of the questions that popped up a few times in the, in the is what about the bugging? <clears throat> Yeah. What's the story about repo driven development and the bugging? Well, I mean, Stuart did a, a very good talk on this, Stu Halloway, um, which was uh, the scientific method thing where he was uh, Sherlock Holmes consulting developer. Uh, and I know one of the, the things, I can't remember if it's part of that or uh, another talk that he did where he basically 
um, ran a modified version of the REPL that, if it got any exception at all, just said, you know, oops, it's broken, and didn't give you any information about the failure. Uh, and his point was that you can use evaluation in the REPL and uh, you know, manually instrumenting your code to see what went wrong, and you can evaluate each or each form inside a function to see where you are getting the failures and where you're getting the correct results and inspect. So that may sound a little primitive to people who are used to uh, things like step debuggers. Uh, I'm I'm one of those developers who just I've never liked step debuggers. Uh, I've worked on some systems in C and C++ where they were they were virtually the only way to get at what was running inside uh, a, a program. But when I'm working with Clojure, I find that evaluating things in the REPL, um, one of the things I didn't show but uh, I have as a hotkey is if I have a let that has bindings, um, if I select the symbol and the expression, I have a hotkey that turns that into a def uh, in the current namespace. And so that then allows me to evaluate subsequent forms inside the function as standalone forms. Uh, and a, you know, one of the tricks that people say is, oh yeah, you can put a def inside your function and it will define as a top level variable you can expect the last value that went through that. Uh, you can also do that with tap, of course. Uh, and if you have uh, taps in your code, like I said, you can leave them in there, they do not harm. Um, but they can give you a very uh, good insight into the data that's flowing through the app. Um, you could, for example, capture the last 100 taps because you can add a tap watcher uh, and remove it very easily. Um, and I just, I just don't find a step-by-step -step debugger to be all that productive, to be honest. Um, you know, if you if you have absolutely no idea what a code base is doing and you're brand new to it, I can sort of see maybe you might be able to explore with a step debugger. Um, but frankly, you know, I'd just go and stick some taps in it and see what data is flowing through certain points. Um, I actually recently had to do that at work. Uh, there was a piece, a fairly large piece of the code base that was written by a developer who um, since moved on, and it's been rock solid. It's great code. I just hadn't worked on it, and it was very, very data driven. Um, but it was all written before spec. So what I did, and this is something that Stu talks about, uh, is writing specs for things and figuring out, okay, we think that the data's like this, let's write a spec for it, instrument the code and see if it is. And so I spent a couple of days writing specs for uh, several of the data structures and a whole bunch of the functions in this code base. And once I had it all running and passing with instrumentation on, uh, I had a really good handle on how the data flowed through the system, even though it was previously a, a large unknown code base. So, I think, you know, Stu isn't just pushing, oh, well, we, we designed Clojure Specs, so you should use it. It really is a very, very good way to approach learning about a code base and debugging it. Would I recommend scope capture? I haven't actually looked at it. Um, I mean, I've seen it mentioned. Uh, yeah, with the add tap stuff, um, you can, yeah, you can add tap any function. Uh, you could, uh, set up code that put, you know, a hundred values in a queue and then just started dropping them uh, and add that tap while you were running code and then remove the tap and you've got that atom or whatever you put them in for you to inspect at leisure. Um, like I say, I have it going to reveal, so I see all the tapped values going into reveal uh, and, you know, reveal will also do things like let you watch an atom or ref uh, and you can see the series of all the values that went through it. You can see the current value. Uh, so I'd say Reveal and tools like it, Rebel and Portal are excellent debugging tools because they let you see the flow while an app is running. So. <laughs> Could I go back and work with OO code? 
Uh, the legacy Cold Fusion code base we have at work is, a, is OO. Um, and it's, I mean, people, people generally don't know much about Cold Fusion, and so they tend to think of it as a sort of weird tag-based proprietary system, um, which it was back in the 1990s. Um, but since around 2000-ish, it's run on the JVM. It's a compile-on-demand uh, language. And I'm trying to think round about the mid-2000s, late-2000s, it got a pretty usable JS-like scripting language. Um, and it has OO features and metaprogramming, and it's dynamic. You can um, add and remove methods in objects. So I do work on that a fair bit. But over time, since we've been using Clojure, uh, it's actually gotten more and more function. Uh, I mean, it had closures before Java got closures. Uh, map, filter, reduce, and all that goodness is, is all in there. So even when I work with a language that's ostensibly OO, I would tend to uh, write it in more functional style these days. Uh, Grasp, I have used Grasp once for looking at a code base. Uh, if I'd had Grasp when I was looking at the particular code base I was talking about, that would have been nice. Um, and in fact, there was something recently, what was the question that cropped up on Slack around that? Um, but Bork Dude uh, posted a, a Grasp expression which could be run on code to find something specific we were looking for in the code. And I was running it on our code base and various people were running it on different code bases to provide information for, that's it, variadic calls to ASOC. How many arguments were in your various calls to ASOC? Um, and in our code base, I found one that actually had 29 arguments, which made me want to go in and look and see what we were doing. So, yeah. Does CF interrupt with closure? Yes. Um, and in fact, that's, that's kind of how I introduced closure into the organization, was I treated closure as a library language. Uh, and I built a little bridge so that it, you could essentially tell the Cold Fusion app which namespaces in Clojure you wanted, and it built a nested data structure that matched the namespaces. And so you could literally in the Cold Fusion code type closure.core.map, and then a function and a data structure. Uh, so that's how we gradually migrated the code base is we've built the Clojure up underneath uh, and swapped out the Cold Fusion code for calling Clojure. And some of the, the Cold Fusion codes pretty horrific because of that, because it, it is doing lots of very imperative closure calls that at some point we will then rip out the top level as well and turn into nice functional closure. Okay, so we're coming up on, on noon Pacific, which I think is 8 p.m. UK time. Uh, any other questions or anything else you'd like me to, to show? Ooh, if I couldn't use Clojure, I'd probably be reasonably happy using Kotlin. Um, I joked when, I think it was when Java 8 came out, I actually wrote a blog post saying that you know, I would no longer feel like I had to kill myself if someone made me use Java. Um, but yeah, I think these days, probably looking at the languages that are out there, if I was doing something on the JVM, I'd be pretty tempted by Kotlin. Uh, if I was doing some systems-y type stuff, um, you know, as a former C, C++ developer, I would probably be reasonably happy. Yes, thank you, Bunny. Uh, reasonably happy uh, doing Rust. I think Rust is a fascinating language. Um, and one of the things that I try and do, um, and that I, you know, definitely advocate is is what the pragmatic programmer recommends, which is to try and learn a new programming language every year or so. Uh, and so over the years, you know, I've learned Go, I've learned Rust, Elm, um, Kotlin, um, various others that I've seen along the way. And you always learn something new about the language you work in if you go and learn another language because you'll find another way of looking at problems.
<laughs> all the Scala refugees in Kirkland. Yes, yes, I, I think you might call me a Scala refugee as well. Yeah, and like I say, feel free to, to ping me on Slack or Twitter or wherever and chat and ask me questions. I'm, I'm happy to dig into any of these topics in more depth online. I think we we get in uh, towards the end. So thank you very much to everybody to for joining today. Thanks Sean for the great presentation. Again, you know, so the I will post the video in the next uh, couple of days in, in the YouTube channel for the London Crusurians. And um, now, if you want to talk to the London Crusurians, just uh, ping me a message. I will organize this for you. Uh, we have a number of talks already scheduled, so look at the uh, meetup page. There is a number of already scheduled until uh, mid mid February, I think. And uh, so, thank you very much to everybody, and I'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.